So my name is Hillary Bassett. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks, and I'm very glad to welcome all of you here today. And I'd also like to uh, say a little extra word of thanks to Max and to all of you for rescheduling with us. It's so great to see you all and to have found another date that so many could, could attend. Now, Greater Portland Landmarks mission is to preserve and revitalize Greater Portland's remarkable legacy of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and parks. Before we start, I'd like to just give you a quick preview of Landmarks programs coming up. For education, we are just opened the observatory for the season just this weekend, and uh, Max and I were just up there, and it is absolutely spectacular, so I encourage you all to put the observatory on your calendar for this, this summer. And then we'll also be doing tours, and this year we're for the first time going to be offering tours of the India Street area, and you'll have a chance to go in the Abyssinian Meeting House, which is the third oldest African-American meeting house in the country, and it is not normally open to the public, so I encourage you to participate in those. We have been very active in advocacy for historic preservation, and I see many familiar faces who have been coming to City Hall. We have been working with neighborhoods and historic uh, community and community groups to encourage historic preservation in those neighborhoods. We have four graduate interns with us. In fact, two are here today. Uh, Sam Shoup and Lauren Patterson, who are, will be working on surveys in neighborhoods all over the city, five neighborhoods this summer. And then of course, we've been working with citizens and neighborhood groups in the Munjoy Hill area to encourage zoning that will support and protect historic buildings and will urge your support to attend the city council on June 4th. And we hope to achieve some designations in that area as well at a later time. Now, a little bit about logistics for tonight. If you have tickets for the reception, it will be in the parish hall, which is on your right. And you have a ticket, so just show the ticket, and that will admit you to the reception. I'd like to take a minute to thank all our sponsors, collaborators, and staff. First, our staff, Kate Lewis, who's right here next to me, Alessa Wiley, Julie Larry, Chloe Martin, and Tova Mellon. I'd also like to thank our preservation partners, Architox, Grow Smart Maine, Maine Historical Society, Maine Preservation, and the Portland Society for Architecture. And I'll give a shout out also to, to the Portland Media Center, you may remember that as CTN, and they are filming the talk, this talk for Community TV, so if a friend or you'd like to see it again, uh, you can see it on Community TV. I'd like to thank also our individual sponsors for making this talk possible, and especially to welcome Vin Verano, who is the president of J.B. Brown, who's going to be saying a few words today. Um, J.B. Brown is one of the oldest companies in Portland. You may have noticed the J.B. Brown building right on Congress Street with the signature right in the middle, right at the center of the building, announcing by J.B. Brown. Uh, and so the company is still alive and well and uh, doing development today. And I'd like to welcome Vin to say a few words of welcome to you. And thank you so much. First, I'd like to thank um, Great Important Landmarks and Hillary, Kate, and the staff and the board for putting together this presentation. Uh, they approached us to see if we would be a sponsor. Uh, given our history in Portland, uh, we were pleased to do that. So uh, thank you for your interest in coming this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank J.B. Brown, uh, the directors, for giving me a fairly long leash and wide berth. Uh, to do what, uh, what we've been doing over the last few years, and especially to Max Page for uh, taking the trip to Portland and sharing with us some of his uh, knowledge and experience. Um, a lot of people know about J.B. Brown, but I, I thought I'd just take a couple minutes to give some context. Uh, the company has been operating in Portland for about 190 years. That's seven generations. Um, it had a strong hand in development on the West End, Gorham's Corner, um, Free Street and Congress Street, both buildings and public spaces. And um, in fact, our oldest property is the former J.B. Brown Sugar House property on Commercial Street, which we recently built the Courtyard um, Hotel. Uh, me personally, I was born in Portland, um, went away to school in Boston and San Francisco, but essentially, I have lived or worked in many of the areas of Portland. I was born by um, Evergreen Cemetery, grew up in Back Cove, have worked in the Old Port for 35 years. My children have gone to school in the West End for 20 years. My wife grew up in 
during Highlands. So we have touched these neighborhoods and I've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, an enormous amount of, of change, especially in the last 10 years. And change is difficult. And so it is important though that we provide every generation the opportunity to make its mark on the landscape. Um, that said, respecting the past. And so I'm looking forward to hearing um, uh, Professor Page and his uh, comments this evening. Um, it's important to have dialogue about these issues rather than getting in silos and becoming echo chambers with one another and everyone agreeing. Um, and so again, I look forward to uh, tonight's presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for your great remarks and also for your sponsorship. I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speaker. And I think I'm echoing a little bit of what you just said, Vin, in that with all the change that is taking place in the greater Portland area, we have been working to save and ensure that special places, the buildings, neighborhoods, and green spaces that define our community have a voice to protect them. As an organization, we are also using this time of change as an opportunity to evaluate how historic preservation can be most relevant and most effective in serving the needs of the entire community into the future. To inspire and perhaps provoke our thinking about preservation and its role today, we invited Max Page to Portland. Page is a professor of architecture and director of historic preservation initiatives at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he teaches and writes about the history of cities and architecture. He has written or edited numerous books, include two, including two recent books about historic preservation. Bending the Future, 50 Ideas for the Next 50 Years of Preservation in the United States, and his recent book published in 2016 by Yale University Press, Why Preservation Matters. Please join me in welcoming Professor Max Page to Portland. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. And again, my apologies for having to reschedule. I have never canceled a talk before, but I think, I don't know if it was told, but my, my father, 95, um, died in the middle of that. So that was his funeral. So I could not come, and I'm really glad we could reschedule and I could be here today. And actually, pieces of this lecture will be places uh, related to his life. So. Um, I had a really lovely tour just now, all too brief, but I think I'll have to come back for a week-long um, Portland excursion sometime. But I got a little bit of a sense of the issues you're dealing with. And I hope that what I talk about today, some of the arguments in why preservation matters, will be useful. And maybe we'll have a conversation after about, the, about these issues. I, I'll start with this. Um, and it's. Uh, this is a, a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. This is after they finally completed the march from Selma to Montgomery. And he says, and you know these lines, I'm sure, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Derived from Theodore Parker, abolitionist in, the, in, the, in, New, in Massachusetts, um, of course, Martin Luther King, it's a, a form of preservation or adaptive reuse. He took a quote that was much more jumbled and made it much more elegant. And there's a lot of danger in when you start by quoting from Martin Luther King Jr. To, 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 there's a delusions of grandeur that could be, um, one could be accused of. But what I'm suggesting is that we bend preservation, in, in continue to bend the preservation movement so that it is tied to the social justice movements of our day. My, my argument is, and this has developed over, over years of teaching and thinking about historic preservation, is that this is preservation's movement, mo moment. We can kind of escape some of the accusations of elitism of, of, of this movement and show how preservation is tied to the important quests for social justice in our, in our own time. And I'm going to try to focus on just three areas in which I think preservation is central to the kind, building the kind of world we want to live in. So let me just start, though, acknowledging that this, this writing, both these books that Hillary mentioned, comes out of reflecting on 50 years of the National Historic Preservation Act. 1966, passed a month and signed into law by Lyndon Johnson a month after I was born. Um, and it was a good moment for reflection, and it's also a good moment to note the successes. Um, and this you may, you may recognize. This is Penn Station in New York City, destroyed between 1963 and 
and 66 and led directly to the creation of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission and then the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, and there you can see the glory of that building and it took these years to tear down this block long building, one of the great public buildings in the United States. Um, and what I love, or what I hate, love, is if you've been to Penn Station, Amtrak Station in New York City, while you are waiting, of course, for a delayed train, they provide photographs of the building you don't get to experience anymore because it was torn down. And I find there's something, something, deeply, <laughs> there's something deeply cruel about that, that as you're waiting there, you're looking at, oh, this is what I could have been living in. So the, the I don't like to... I have a different book called Giving Preservation to History, which talks about how preservation began long, long before the destruction of Penn Station and the creation of the National Preservation Act. That's another story. But it was a signal moment in which, the, in which we gained this national law that has structured so much of what we do in preservation. And while Pre Penn Station had to die, unfortunately, um, and you know, this is my, I got interested in architecture because, or in part because of one professor I had in college, Vincent Scully, and he famously said about this building that we once entered the city like gods, and now we scuttle in like rats. <laughs> but that's very different than if you come on the other line, the other train line into New York City, into Grand Central Station. And the difference of that experience is profound about how you experience entering a city. And Penn Station died so that Grand Central could live, right? Grand Central was also threatened with them destruction. And as you may know, the, the Penn Central case um, in 1978 was a sort of the big test of whether preservation laws, local preservation laws, um, were legitimate. And they challenged, what the challenge was, was that preservation laws were taking the property of the property owner, right? You were essentially limiting their use. You couldn't tear this down, we were saying to build a tower on top. So you're, that's essentially a taking of my pri property. But the Supreme Court ruled, a very, very pr profound, important ruling, was that the value uh, to the community of preserving its history and its architecture had to be weighed, could be balanced against the, the rights of the property owner. Very powerful idea, and it gets back to the fundamental reason why preservation is, I would argue, a social justice activity. Because what we do at the starting point, and I will be talking about economic development and the like in a minute, but at the starting point is that we argue that there are values beyond the market, beyond monetary sale, that deserve to be honored. That's at the baseline what we, what we do. We say there's something important here architectural importance, historical importance, cultural importance, whatever it might be, we are saying that value has to be balanced again and as maybe even stands equal to or above at times to other kinds of values and values of the market. Very, very important idea that was, that was protected um, by the Supreme Court decision that protected Grand Central Station. The successes are well beyond just these, these individual great buildings. I mean, think of how we have broadened the idea of what we consider Im important, f such as the Stonewall Inn, right? This, it was now a national historic landmark. This is the kind of the a key point landmark in the gay rights movement in New York City that is now a local landmark as well as a national landmark. Also, in, here in the Bronx, an important cultural center. This store that has been around, one of the first Latino music stores that is, and has been anchored there for years. This would not have been considered historic landmark decades ago. So we've broadened, we have these sort of concentric circles as we've expanded what we consider important. And then this Worcester Square in New Haven. Nothing important happened in this particular buildings. The buildings themselves are not extraordinary, but they are part of the fabric of neighborhoods that make up livable cities. So part of what we have done over the past 50 years is also start to preserve the, the texture of this. I mean, the, the idea of the sidewalk and the stoop and the, and the three or four story buildings, that line, that is what creates livable cities. I was just talking to Hillary, I just come back from a trip and I took my son to, to, to Berlin and in other cities, and he didn't like Berlin much at all, partly because there was so, so much had been destroyed in the war, that even though they've tried, there is no t they've tried to rebuild those neighborhoods nicely, there's not a lot of historic fabric to give a sense of place. If I just talked about successes of the past 50 years, that would be a very boring talk. What I want to do is, in this time, 
I issue kind of three challenges. Essentially look at kind of issues that we were not prepared to deal with in 1966 when the National Preservation Act was uh, passed and suggest the ways we need to challenge ourselves. Nothing I'm suggesting here, these three areas I'm gonna be talking about are brand new. You're all engaged with each of these areas that I'm gonna talk about. Sustainability, climate change, economic development, and dealing with sort of complicated, difficult histories. What I'm suggesting is we need to continue to bend that curve and continue with greater urgency to be involved in these, in these efforts. So let me just start um, with the question of how preservation plays a role in building a more sustainable, um, environmentally sustainable world. So this is, um, I just, this past weekend, it was celebrated my 30th college reunion. I remember with being a bartender at the 25th reunion of those older people, and I was like, how could, that? that's never gonna be me, ever, so now. So this is Croon Hall at Yale, and it's a, it's a LEED Platinum building. Many of you know the LEED rating system, and this is the, you know, the cutting edge, almost a net zero building. That building will take about 50, 70, different estimates, 50 to 70 years to pay off its carbon debt. And you know what that means, right? To, to create the materials, to ship them here, to build the building, costs an enormous amount of energy, put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, so that even though it's a very, very efficient building, it will take years and years, decades, before this building actually can start to be, to play its role in building a much more um, environmentally sustainable world, right? So this is one of the misleading ideas of, of, our, of our kind of high-tech approach to building sustainably. I would argue that, in fact, historic buildings, as you well know, this famous line, um, is that the greenest building is the one that's already built. Those have already paid their debt over many, many times. So preservation should be absolutely central to any notion of building sustainable future. I'm, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but you need to then go preach this beyond this podium um, out into the wider world because it is starting to change, but still far too much, I see this in, our, in our, my classes in the, in the architecture school at UMass Amherst, that still the emphasis is to start, if you're thinking about in, environmental sustainability, to start with what's the latest technology? Where do we put the solar panels, the geothermal, et cetera, et cetera? And not to start with how do we reuse um, reuse buildings. So I'm going to return though to a place, um, in, I live in this green valley, the, they call it the Happy Valley, paradise, a little bit western Massachusetts, and people always focus on our sustainable um, community supported agricultural farms, and there you can see a nice farm that has solar panels, it's all great, I have no problem with it at all. But I would suggest to you that the greenest place where it, near me is actually the dirty industrial city of Holyoke. Have anyone been to Holyoke, Mass? Oh, okay, a lot of people have been there, good. So Holyoke, as you can see here, let's see if I can get this little pointer to work. You know, this is just the falls, so at 60 feet of, um, at the falls at South Hadley, very fairly steep falls of the Connecticut River, and they have, they, back in the 1850s, channeled this into this lovely canal system. And so you have, you had one of the, the, the center of the paper making industry in, in, the, in the nation was there, as well as textiles and, and silk. And it's simply by that water flowing downhill, being channeled through these raceways from one canal to the, down to another, down to another, and then back into the Connecticut River, that they still, to this day, power 65% of the electrical needs in the city of Holyoke. Of course, there was no needs for computers, et cetera, back then. So this is a place that is sustainable because of the investments made 150 years ago. In the, in the layout of these canals, in these buildings, these very, very strong industrial buildings, some of which you, I know you have here in Portland. Holyoke should be the place where we invest our energy and our in, in channel development to the city because by its nature, it is much more sustainable even than where I live in the upper valley of the nice green organic farms because of course we drive everywhere and we are generally living in more um, contemporary contemporary homes. So um, with slight switches in tax incentives, in laws, we could make Holyoke a center for economic development. It is still one of the poorest cities, in fact, in Massachusetts, but it should not be if you consider the people who live there as doing a community service by living in, very, in, in the city that has a very low carbon footprint. 
If we start to change our thinking, you'll see how historic places like this actually have enormous, enormous uh, value. Now, one of the challenges of having preservation be central to the sustainability movement is that we are going to also have to look ourselves in the mirror. Um, and this is where the provocative part comes in, or the, 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 the tomato throwing may begin. It means that we are going to have to think about preserving as much as possible. Re and by preserving, I mean reusing, continuing to use. Not just the ones we think are beautiful, not just the ones we think have historic value, but we should be thinking as preservationists, of, as conservationists, of, re of reusing existing buildings whenever possible. Right? And that means when we may have to get a little less fussy about some of our preservation techniques. Many of the buildings that we want to preserve were not in, did not have the intent of the kind of museum care that sometimes we apply to, to, to um, contemporary to our, the buildings today. This is just one of those examples of battle over windows. Anyone been involved in a battle over windows? Yes, you were preservationists. But this is a case where there was an argument but I would, about whether the ones on the right were compatible or not. I would suggest that there are times in which we have become overly concerned about, about um, the kind of authenticity, I put that in quotes, a very difficult con concept, um, to the point of not encouraging the, tra the, the, reuse, the adaptive reuse of buildings. Um, Another way, and I, this is an odd one to show, this is Mong Kok. This is a section of Hong Kong, one of the densest places on planet Earth. I don't think Portland should be that dense, but we need to encourage density. I was on top of the observatory looking out, and I know there's a big debate about, about building there. We want, preservationists should be leading in the encouragement of more dense, walkable, and tr public transportation supported cities, and that means rethinking some of our historic buildings, thinking about additions, thinking, encouraging that in a, in, a, um, in a thoughtful manner, but encouraging it nonetheless. That has to be part of our, of our charge, to build those more dense cities that can be more um, environmentally friendly. And I'd like to also suggest, um, and I, I'm glad that I was hearing from some of the staff about how um, Portland Landmarks is, is so central to debates about building good architecture. This is a very hard slide to see, I'm sorry. Preservationists have to be advocates of great contemporary architecture. That may be a truism, but I want to encourage, by contemporary, I mean cutting edge, pushing the boundaries. Because of course, we want architecture 50 years from now that we want to preserve, that we will be fighting to preserve because they're such great emblems of this particular moment. And I give you an example of, this is, Cast the Castel Vecchio by Carlo Scarpa. I had the great privilege of spending a semester at the American Academy in Rome, which meant I got to travel around the country and see many of Carlo Scarpa's project. Mid-20th mid century architect, not widely known, not widely, did not do many buildings outside of Italy. But um, he is an example of an architect who's designed, when you enter, for instance, this museum, you feel like you, you are grasping, you're experiencing a designer's great work, and yet you are even appreciating the historic building that he's working in even more. So that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, too often we either, the new design overwhelms the historic or the architect pulls back far too much and actually doesn't do as great individual contemporary work while trying to be overly respectful of the historic fabric. In fact, an example like that, or um, or I just came from David Chipperfield, the Neues Museum in Berlin, are examples where you feel like there's a, a great hand, a creative hand at work, but also respectful of the historic fabric. Or, or this, the Mercado Santa Catarina in, in Barcelona by Enrico um, Morales, where you have this historic market that then just gets this dramatic rooftop. Um, people, we can obviously, every, all of these can be argued over whether they are in fact a violation of the historic fabric or not, but I'm suggesting that preservationists should lead in encouraging great architecture that is within or attached to and that re refurbishes historic buildings. So, just this first part, preservation is and should we need to confidently argue that you cannot build sustainable communities without doing a lot more preservation. And I would suggest we should be reversing 
the way we do preservation in most places, which is there is the right, usually it's the right of building, and then preservationists get to intervene and say, wait, demolition delay, pause. I think it should be reversed. I think the assumption should be that all buildings should be reused, and that then there is a justification on the part of developers to say, here's why we have to tear this down. Now, this is an idea Tom Mays, a friend who I was at the American Academy with, he's with the National Trust, has suggested that communities consider that idea. Again, it's not saying no destruction ever, it's saying the starting point should be we as a community need to save and reuse our buildings, both for cultural reasons but also for environmental reasons. And then if you need to tear it down, you need to justify why, why it can't be adaptively reused. So con consider that one as a local ordinance. Okay, part two. What it, one of the hardest things as preservationists is that um, is we are accused of, of e economic elitism, right? That preservation is for rich people, preservation is for those who have time to deal with the, you know, these aesthetic elite ideas. I think there's nothing further from the truth. But we need to make, we may need to adopt attitudes and policies that make that crystal clear. If we go back to 1966, again, I'm sort of looking at challenges that may not have been on the minds of preservationists at that point. One could argue, I think they, rightly, that the United States was becoming more economically equal. There were still enormous gulfs, class gulfs, racial gulfs, and the like, but there was, through the Great Society, there was movement towards, um, towards greater equality, and there was, a, there was a bigger middle class. We have moved quite, quite far away from that. Can preservation, this is the question, can preservation be part of building cities that are more economically equal, egalitarian, and, and just? And I take you to this building right here, which is a, should be a historic landmark, because this is, and I will just show you, this is um, the house, this is about 10 years ago now, sold for three and a half million dollars, now that would be a bargain, it's probably five million dollars. This is 555 Hudson Street. Does anyone know perhaps who that lives there? That's this lady, this great writer, one of the great urbanists of our age, Jane Jacobs. Um, you can see it, just a stack of the first five of her 15 books that she wrote. Um, and she lived there and she developed her attitude towards cities and frankly also to, towards preservation and historic buildings by looking out her window. I got, it, I got to go in there because I was pretended that I was interested in buying that house. <laughs> see, in this day and age, you can look like me and you, people are going to be like, maybe he's a dot-commer who has millions and millions of dollars, right? They couldn't tell, so they let me in. So this is her view from her bedroom. And she looked out and she developed an attitude about approach to how you build cities, which is in part to preserve the regular older buildings as well as encouraging new development. She actually wasn't so interested in architectural beauty or even historical importance. This is something that's often missed in, if you read her, and I urge you to read Death and Life of Great American Cities. She was simply interested in having the, the texture and the economic mix that comes with having older and, and newer buildings. What she couldn't account for, that's not her fault, she wrote this in 1961, she was seeing a world where she thought that this neighborhood could, could remain relatively mixed. Um, economically mixed, um, but she could not foresee that her house would then sell for three and a half million dollars um, decades after she left. And if you know the West Village, this is a block away from the High Line, this is a very, very wealthy neighborhood. Uh, this is sort of the picture of intense gentrification. And that preservation, unfortunately, gets linked together with gentrification. Right? That's one of the first things out of people's mouth. I say, oh, I'd study preservation. They say, oh, you're encouraging gentrification of our cities. So how do we challenge that? And I go back to my mother's house, actually, in Camden, New Jersey. This was her house. This was the kosher butcher. They lived up above there. And it's a, Camden, like Holyoke, it's one of the poorest cities. Um, Camden is even in, in worse shape than, than Holyoke. If we went and looked here and talked about the, the, the mansard roofs and how we need to preserve that as a, you know architectural style, that would not resonate with the desperate needs of the community there. So the question is, as preservationists, can we argue for reusing, preserving these buildings in a way that can actually benefit communities there? And I'm going to suggest that I went to a quick little tour to a couple places that I've studied or, or visited that offer a way to talk about how we do preservation in a way that can promote real economic development, not just economic development, but, but equitable economic development. 
and don't, don't get too upset when I tell you that I'm going to Cuba first. Um, but there are lessons to be learned here. If you've been there, the old Havana, one of the great collections of um, buildings of this, of this period, the 16th, 17th and 18th century, um, if you look here, and I've taken this image, I took this photograph particularly looking up. Why is that? In the distance, you see the Capitol, modeled after our Capitol building. And then you see this whole row of buildings on either, on, that have been you know, preserved. Now, down below are tourist stores, right? And they bring in tourists, hard currency, and there's hotels, and there's restaurants that cater to the millions of tourists that come in. But if you look up above, it's a little hard. You can see there's the jeans drying up there. Regular people are still living on the upper floors, and this is not by accident in, in Havana. Havana is, the old Havana is owned by the city historian. It's the most powerful historian in the world. <laughs> they own all of the land of old Havana, and they are to exploit it, partly to bring in money from outside through tourist dollars, but that means also that they can do a different kind of techniques, and one of them is that they train young people in the arts of preservation, they then give them jobs, and this is key, not just training, but training that is, then leads directly to jobs to renovate the buildings in Old Havana, and then sometimes live in them. Now, I am not suggesting some kind of um, nirvana. The people there were quite open about some of the real problems, some of the corruptions that go on with this, but there's also great pride in having trained eight, 9,000 young people in the arts of preservation and then putting them, providing them with real jobs in doing that work. Okay? I will come back to that in a minute. Um, another place, very quickly, Berlin, where I just was. Um, you may remember um, from the 1980s, the International Building Exhibition. Many of the key postmodern architects of the time got their start in Berlin. Peter Eisenman, one of his very first buildings at Checkpoint Charlie. John Haduk, um, Zaha Hadid actually got her first job there. Robert A.M. Stern. That was one side of this big building project in Berlin. All, bring in some great new architects, let them go wild. But there was a quieter side to that this building projects of the 70s and 80s, and that was restoring some of the old industrial and um, what's called Mietzkaserne, kind of a part, you know, uh, tenement buildings in the Kreuzberg area and other, in Prenzlauerberg, different areas, working class areas of Berlin. Those have proved much more lasting, and they were the anchor for creating these vibrant new neighborhoods because they were not just about pre preservation, but they were also about providing people with the skills and then the jobs to renovate these empty warehouses and then to live in them. So it was a whole process, not simply preserving and restoring the buildings. We have, a, that, we have examples closer to home. Um, this is a land trust in, in, south, in sort of the south part of the Dudley Square neighborhood of Boston. If you look at these buildings, they are not unlike the ones I just saw on Monjoy Hill. There are three deckers in, in this area. But they are, these three, and as well as 197 more, are in a land trust. In other words, the community was worried about the gentrification. Boston is a very overheated real estate market. And they said, we need to preserve this community's mix of incomes. And so they set into this land trust a whole series of houses so that they will permanently be middle and lower income even as other areas get developed. Right? So this is not about architectural preservation, it's about community preservation. The Astor Gates in the south side of Chicago has taken long abandoned buildings like this bank building in the, um, in the Stony Island Arts Bank and created this incredible library and places for local artists. Um, the, uh, Rick Lowe uh, this is the Project Row Houses um, effort in Houston, where a lot of these shotgun shacks have been converted both into housing but also into cultural facilities. So one of the poor neighborhoods of the city is not just treated as kind of a, you know, housing for the poor, they should all live there, but rather this should also be a vibrant cultural district. Um, an, an, another project that is in Buffalo is the Youth Build partnership with what's called Push Buffalo. And they've trained young people in how to take regular buildings and make them much more environmentally um, sustainable, much more environmentally efficient. And in Buffalo, obviously, that matters a whole lot. It could save, it could make uh, housing much more affordable if you make the, the cost of heating that much more affordable. So they're trained and then they're put to work, again, in making regular buildings more sustainable. <clears throat> 
So these are just our examples of how preservation becomes a tool for providing real jobs. And one of the basic ideas that we think many of you know is that preservation is much more local, long-term um, labor. That rather than bring in some, a multinational to drop in some, some prefab houses, when you do preservation work, you are building a greater um, local economy around building and restoring. But let me go push a little further on this issue and have us think even beyond maybe the techniques we've been thinking about. I go back to Holyoke and I think about the 1930s, the Great Depression, right? And this is a group of, of, of young men of part of the Civilian Conservation Corps, right? So there was enormous, enormous um, you know, deprivation, unemployment, and so we decided as a nation we had to put people back to work and looked around and said, well, there's work to be done. For instance, building state parks. So the Mount Tom State Park Reservation, which is, Mount Tom is right above Holyoke, they built the pathways and the campgrounds, right? And then back in the city, they built the World War I Memorial and the post office. So much, you all know this, so much of what you walk on when you go to your state parks or when you go to your public buildings were built out of that incredible depression in other words, it was a moment to say, let's build our public facilities. Let's use the moment to put people back to work by building public facilities. And we're talking about that today, right? We are talking about new, needing to do public infrastructure projects. The question is, will we do a works progress administration? That's what we did in the 1930s, generally new buildings. Or will we do a works preservation administration? Will we decide that part of the way we put people back to work and fix our infrastructure is actually restoring it and reusing what we have, including restoring and reusing what was built back in the 1930s, which is still still strong and still with us, but needs, needs repair. This is an incredible opportunity to hire young people, to give them the skills that are long-lasting skills, and put them to work in doing the, the vital work of restoring our infrastructure. It has to happen at some point and in some way, right? The pipes, the subways, the train lines, they're all collapsing. And so they need to be restored. The question is how do we do it in a way that actually promotes um, real jobs for people who don't, don't have them? That is a preservation, that is, that's part of our job as preservationists to advocate for those kind of policies, statewide and national, and direct them towards um, preservation. I want to end this section um, very briefly by Getting back to uh, some of the placards and protesting that I saw uh, at, at, at the headquarters this afternoon, because we talk about it as a preservation movement. In fact, a, a friend of mine who will go nameless criticized the book a little bit, says, you talk about this movement, it's not a movement at all. I said, well, that's the point. I want it to be a movement. And a movement involves sometimes challenging things. And here is a group that, would, that does not call itself a preservation organization, but I insist that it is. This is City Life, Vita Urbana, in, in a long-standing 50-year-old, 45-year-old, I just went to its, its 45th uh, birthday celebration, 45-year-old organization that one of its goals is it promotes low-income housing, affordable housing in Boston, but also is willing to press back against evictions. Um, and we've had, of course, different at different times and most recently big waves of evictions by national banks. And they often will go and they will block, they will perform civil disobedience to block um, the sheriff from coming in and letting Bank, America, Bank of America take back a house to kick the people out. They, as I said, they don't consider themselves a preservation organization because they said, and I talked to Lisa Owens, who's the director, and she said, well, we're not so interested in the architecture. I said, but you're interested in people living in homes in their community and preserving that mix of who lives in that community. That's a preservationist. That's, or that's what we, we should be out there on that line, <laughs> right? In the sense that we, that's what we're interested in ultimately. We're, we want to preserve beautiful buildings, but we also care what goes on inside. If they are hollowed out, like in Jane Jacobs Hudson Street, if we preserve the facades of that neighborhood, that's, it's a fine thing, it's a good thing to do to pervert, preserve a walkable neighborhood, but if everything behind it is of one race and one class, then I don't think we've done our duty. And so that is what, that's what they're challenging here. Okay, my third, third point I'd like to, to, look, to talk to you about. When you think about 1966, when the National Preservation Act was passed, we had just been through more than a generation where 
immigration had been very much narrowed in the United States. After 1927, these series of laws had really restricted how many people could um, come into this country. But the 1965 Hart Seller Act had intended to open pres uh, immigration up, and it actually had the intent of widening it dramatically. So the nation that you know today, with greater immigrants coming from Central and South America, from Asia, is the product of that act that took place, that was, that was passed right before the National Preservation Act. In other words, when we think about today, our work of who we are serving, we are serving an incredibly diverse nation that will only become more diverse just by natural, natural uh, reproduction, whether or not immigration is, is stopped. This is becoming a far more diverse, I would argue, far more um, interesting, vibrant um, nation. But it poses issues of how do you knit together people who are of increasingly diverse origins, religions, and beliefs. And one way I would argue that as preservationists we can do that is not only preserving the sites that represent the best of all these different groups and their histories, but also looking at those places of conflict and violence and challenge. And one of the, I think one of the most vibrant areas of preservation is in the dealing with what we'll just simply call difficult places. This is for whatever we want to talk about our nation, it is also a nation of enormous amount of bloodshed and violence directed um, at, at one another and, and particular groups. The only way to knit together kind of a national identity with an increasingly diverse nation is to acknowledge those places, to preserve them and then interpret them powerfully. That's what I would challenge you with. I would suggest that this, this is the Robert E. Lee statue on Monument Avenue in Richmond. This is one way of knitting together. It's essentially by erasing other histories and you declare this is the story of the city of Richmond and the South. And this Monument Avenue, if you may know, it's a beautiful, beautiful avenue of historic buildings. And it also has a series of celebrations, men on horses, of Confederate generals. Um, and it is to, has been so powerful, that narrative, that it would, they were able to erase in Richmond with the help of I-95, which I was just riding on, I-95 running through Richmond with federal government money, erased the history of slavery in Richmond. This was the second largest slave market in the United States outside of New Orleans. Had anyone heard of Shaco Bottom? Maybe you all have, but very, I studied, I have a PhD in American history. We did not study that site at all. We, know, we didn't, I don't remember that word ever coming up in my studies in American history, and partly because it was erased, or at least it was covered over. Archaeologist friends tell me, it's not erased, it's covered over. There's something underneath, and indeed there is. In fact, there is this, you can see at the bottom here, there is underneath this, they have uncovered, they had to go 10 feet down, um, the remains of one of the most notorious um, prisons and you know, selling complexes in Shaco Bottom. So I'm going to come back to Shaco Bottom towards the very end, but um, I'm again going around the world in part because I think other countries have um, more willingly or been forced to more creatively in deal with their history in ways that we can learn from and we're starting to learn from. And this, as I mentioned, my, my father, who was almost 95, would be 95 next week, grew up in Berlin. And this is, in fact, his album, um, around the 1936 Olympics. This is the Jesse Owen Olympics. But you see, he's taking pictures of all these historic places, but they also have the, the swastikas covering there, covering, covering everything. But Germany, which I have found in my very complicated engagement over the many years, has done an enormous amount to demand that, that the issue of what was, what was done in the name of that nation um, be not forgotten. And this is the, there are new buildings like Dane Liebeskind's Jewish Museum, um, in sort of the southern part of, of the center of Berlin. There's Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra's uh, National Holocaust Memorial. This is adjacent to, or just across from the parliament building, the Reichstag. That is not analogous exactly, but is if we put a four acre monument to slavery right on the front porch of the Capitol building. I mean, that's the level of kind of a symbol, symbolic territory that this is. Um, but they've done other things as well, like uncover community archaeologists. I mean, guerrilla archaeologists started just digging in an area where they knew was the, the sort of the SS headquarters, the Gestapo headquarters, and have uncovered the torture chambers and all that went on there. They've 
they have been willing to embrace contemporary design in some of the most historic buildings, such as the Reichstag. Um, Norman Foster designed this, um, this glowing um, rooftop to um, the Reichstag where you can look down into the, uh, to the workings of parliament and to look out over the city. But they've also done something which I think we've only really begun to do, which is in, in, engage artists and encourage them to do really boundary-pushing um, memorials, such as these temporary projections of Jewish life onto the, store, the, the buildings of Berlin, you know, decaying buildings of the Kreuzberg neighborhood, where it almost looks for a moment you were brought back in time. Or many of you know of the Stolperstein, the stumble steps. It's, very, it's perhaps the largest memorial in the world because there are now about 100,000 of these in different countries. It started though, one man said, you know, we're, we're simply going to take out the cobblestone and put in, I'm going to, he did this on his own without permission, put the cobblestone with simply the name of the person who, I mean, it was a Jewish person who lived there and then was sent off to Auschwitz or one of the other concentration camps. And the idea is that you are to stumble over it and be reawoken, re, and you were brought back to paying attention to that which happened in, in their name. And they're all over Germany, and now other countries have adopted it for their own atrocities. And I just visited this memorial, and again, a memorial in historic site is the purview of preservationists, I would say. Because this plaza, you would not know what's going on there, and there is no plaque exactly to explain what this is. But you walk across this Babelplatz, and you see suddenly this glass opening. And then you get closer, you look down, and it's, a, it's about a 20 foot by 20 foot room underneath the ground level, and it's just empty white bookshelves. And then there's a little tiny note that suggests this is in memorial to the, to the, um, the books that were burned on that as part of Hitler's you know, um, work. And it's a very powerful evocation of the books that were burned and also the books that were never written because the people themselves were burned. Very quickly, moving along different part of the world that I visited and, and looked at how they have dealt with, um, in Argentina, one of their most painful episodes where 30,000 of their own citizens were murdered by the state in the 1970s and early 1980s. This is one of the prisons where, um, the, where the people who were considered dangerous were held and sometimes tortured. And the building you can see was being, was being torn down. But this artist, um, Seth Wilson, figured out a way to kind of, how do you deal with these glass bricks if you can maybe make pixelated images? And so he popped out some of the glass, left others, so that you could see certain times of day these faces of the prisoners who were there, fully knowing, you could see as the building was coming down, that this artwork would disappear. Many of this is recognized, many of the artwork of this, of this genre recognizes the impermanence of the city, but wants to make a mark that will then live on in people's minds. And we have started in the United States really to do a lot to recognize the difficult places, such as Manzanar. Japanese internment camp, which is a national historic park. After many years of being you know, quietly set aside, it is now quite an important um, part of the National Park Service. Or when I went to visit the city of Money, Mississippi, which you may know because in, it was in August of uh, 1955 that Emmett Till, a young boy from Chicago visiting his family, was murdered there. And it was one of the kind of key catalysts for the modern civil rights movement. When I went there the first time, these are photographs I took, the, the store where the incident happened that led to his murder was just falling down, left that way. Well, years later, there is a Mississippi Freedom Trail. And actually, the information on there is pretty good, but it's still a plaque. And you know, if you've seen our National Register plaques, most of them say virtually nothing. I noticed the one on the and the observatory is actually pretty good. It actually gives some information, but many of them simply say it's on the National Register. Well, we need to do much more to encourage artists to push the boundaries, things that make people uncomfortable at sites of discomfort. I don't know why we, we, we should be worried about that. We should encourage that. And we have great examples of mural projects in Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, which are, are using, frankly, the, the, the texture of lots of empty lots to tell stories about city life. Or um, Christoph Wodushko, an MIT professor who does, does these massive projections, for instance, on the Bunker Hill Monument. Um, and many of you may know of the, 
the recent opening just a few weeks ago of Brian Stevenson's Memorial to Peace and Justice, which captures the history of lynching in the United States. And while you, this may seem like, a, again, a memorial and not a preservation work, in fact, it is very much imagining historic places because it has a column for every single town and all the lynchings that took place in them. And the goal, of course, in his mind is not just that you come to Montgomery, but that the columns will leave Montgomery and go to every single town. So the memorial becomes to be a measure of how well small towns across the South are willing to confront their history, because the column is supposed to go back to that place. So there is soil that is brought from each town to the monument, and then there's a column that lists the, the, the people who were lynched and the community from that town is supposed to say, we are ready to put, install this. So we will see as a measure of how well we are able to, conf to, to confront this and the South is able to confront it. This work has been going on for a while. Again, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm simply kind of blowing on the sails, urging that we need to continue this work with greater urgency. This just opened. This is the first monument, true museum to lynching. Right? to the thousands of people who were lynched throughout the South. How can it be that 2018, we're only first now actually documenting the, all the names, as many as we have, in one place? And, you know, I was at the National Trust Conference, uh, this is two years ago, I think, and, uh, you know, a, a, a filmmaker actually made, um, showed this image from Goliad, Texas, which is called The Hanging Tree. And this is where African Americans were hung, but also Mexican Americans. And he has documented the, I don't, can't remember now how many of the hundreds and hundreds of Mexican Americans who were lynched as well. It's a part of, the, a part of our history that many of us may not have known, although now when we think about it, it, says it makes sense. In other words, there's so much more work to do in confronting our difficult histories. Um, the work goes on in Shaco Bottom. This is a project that I've been involved with now for several years. Ever since I wrote about it in, for Preservation Magazine, I was so captivated both by the history as well as the community activists who have been pushing on this now for 15 years to make sure that Shaco Bottom, the history is told there and the city and, and the, the, um, the stories there are uncovered. And one of our goals, it's a little hard to tell here, but one of our goals is to have people stop thinking about Monument Avenue when they come to Richmond, but think of a new memorial. And we have, as part of a memorial park, imagined a grove of lights. And actually, um, we imagined that these grove of lights, like the pixelated images from Buenos Aires, you would see from a distance images, not of Confederate war generals, but of important African Americans from Richmond who have long been left out of the history. And what we've done there, or at least proposed, and it's moving forward slowly, slowly, the, the tragedy in Charlottesville has propelled forward the arguments over the history in Richmond. What we've imagined here is to try to do things, um, th try to do, make proposals that integrate some of the ideas that I've talked about here. We have a memorial park marking the sites, for instance, of Lumpkin's Jail, this notorious jail, as well as other this is a, there was a whole industry, of course, in, human, in the sale and exploitation of, of African Americans, right? Um, in this, so it involved factories, it involved counting houses, it involved places that sold the clothing so you could dress up the slaves so they would look better for sale. I mean, a whole integrated world, right? Um, but also, we want to build in one of the train sheds. This is the train line, the Amtrak train line, in one of the abandoned train um, warehouse buildings to create that kind of school for high school graduates as well as recently incarcerated individuals to learn some of the skills of preservation, of archaeology, of public history, of memorialization, and then that they be provided jobs that comes from some of the developments that would take place, that the money would be channeled for that particular purpose. Because if Shaco Bottom gets developed in a way that the money goes, profit goes out to other places in the city or far beyond, that would seem like another level, another generation of exploitation. That in fact, of all the places in the country, this place where African Americans were exploited, their bodies were literally bought and sold and their labor was exploited, that the development that takes place, whatever money gets generated should be put back into the community. Um, when I first came to Rome, um, this was in 2014, I saw a photograph, this photograph, by Mimo Yoroche, a um, 
an Italian photographer. And, and it's, and you can see this image, it just struck me so powerful, it kind of encapsulated my thought about how preservation needs to be involved with, needs to be centrally involved with confronting difficult places. And here you can see this bust where it is shattered and there has been a repair done, an effort to try to bring it back to where it once was. But you see that it doesn't quite fit, right? And, a hand, even, to, and even to stay in its sort of half-fit state, you need a hand to hold it there. And in some ways that really captured for me what our purpose is in this area, in de dealing with difficult places, is that our job is to bring people to preserve these sites, the difficult sites of violence, of discrimination, of horrors that we don't want to, we don't want to confront, help us confront them, but with a, with a kind of a gentle hand of encouraging dialogue, encouraging conversation about what this, what this means for our communities. Now, just to, just to end here and wrap up, and um, one of the questions you might be thinking is, in the back of your mind is, I'm with you, Max, but what about beauty? Like, aren't we all partly preservationists because we love beautiful places, beautiful buildings and landscapes? And yes, yes, I agree. And I can think of, when I started to make a list in writing this book of the beautiful places that like, come to mind, the list was went on for pages. And so I just give you a couple, such as the Taj Mahal, having waking up at four in the morning to be there in, in pitch black, and then slowly see this incredible sight emerge, and then to turn a corner and see a man sort of sweeping up to beautify this, this, um, this building was, was one of those places. There are, we, we all mark the years of our lives in many ways by the beautiful places that we've been. So I'm not opposed to beauty whatsoever. And I think of as well, one of the kind of last days of my time in Rome was to going to um, Pentecost Mass, which you may find ironic, um, <laughs> in, in the Pantheon. And if you know that what happens at the end of the Mass is that thousands of real rose petals are dropped through the oculus onto the congregation. It's an incredible, incredible moment to, to see this nice Jewish boy felt very like moved by this, this ceremony. I found it very, very powerful. And this, so this historic building, this several 2,000 year old building gained a new kind of power, a new kind of meaning through, through this, this act. Um, so that brings me back to that first image. And you may have, I don't know if you may have find, found it ironic that a, a book that is trying to argue that preservation needs to be about social justice struggles has this building, this beautiful building. Many of you may know this, one of my, my other favorite interior space, the New York Public Library reading room. Um, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say I chose my dissertation topic so that I could work in the New York Public Library reading room. It's, and I think actually that's as good a reason as any to choose a dissertation topic. It's a glorious, glorious space. And I put it up there partly to be ironic. It is a beautiful space. And I, you have a career in Hastings City Hall down, just down the street here. The, the New York Public Library is one of those great public buildings. It is an architectural masterpiece. You appreciate the power of the architectural gestures and the details when you're in there. But the reason that I love that building is as much, as much, the, the mission, which is this building is one of the great public libraries of the world. It's open to anyone. You walk in, you sit down, you look up a book, you put in your request. It used to be a little vacuum-packed little thing that they had, and it's still there. They don't really work anymore, but you would write down the thing. It would go deep into the bowels of the building. 20 minutes later, you get the, get the book. No questions asked, anyone. When you sit there at those big oak tables, you could have a Nobel Prize winner to your right. You could have the immigrant studying for the SAT to the left. Someone um, unsteady writing an 8,000-page letter to the president. You have anyone who's in there. And to me, this is inseparable, um, the architecture and the function. So when I think of the beauty equation in our work, which I think is central, we all, what we find beautiful is also um, the places that we need the most, that perhaps as Alain de Baton, maybe some of you may know of, know of him, a uh, philosopher, says it's we crave in, in our buildings that which we feel like we lack. So there's many places I could end with, but it seems to me at this moment in our history, in our time, that one of the reasons I've drawn to this is that not only beautiful 
a beautiful room, but it's a public room, and it's a free room, and it's a room that's held in common. And that is as much a pursuit. When we pursue the preservation and reuse of beautiful spaces like this that serve an important function of being free and open to all, we have fulfilled much of our purposes. Thank you. Thanks. You didn't talk about money. You well, talked about what maybe we should do. You didn't talk about how to fund those processes. Like back <coughs> in the Depression, we, we ran up a pretty big national debt to put all those people to work, right? Correct. So maybe, maybe we don't want our debt to be too much bigger right now. So how do we, how do, we do what you're asking without paying for it? Well, so it's a very good question. We have to pay for it if we're going to do it. So the question is how. So it's interesting what you said. We, went, we did go to, it was the first major, major debt that we entered into to do the New Deal projects. And that launched the greatest era of prosperity in American history. So, in other words, you pay for it, and it comes back it comes back to you. Um, w one of the things, and this, um, I was telling Hillary that my I'm taking a little side route in my career. Is one of the things I've been very involved with is uh, is uh, ed education policy, and I'm going to be the vice president of our statewide teachers union. And one of the things we've pushed for is um, progressive taxes. And part of our argument is that we've all lived under an austerity mindset. That, in fact, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, it happens to be in pockets of people that we've not requested it for. In other words, there are ways nationally we would fund it in the way we have we funded these in the past, either by debt or by new taxes on those th the wealthiest among us. And we do that at the local level and state level as well. In Massachusetts, I don't know the situation in Maine. I suspect it's not that different. We cut three and a half billion dollars in, in tax cuts um, out of our budget. Part of that money would go towards these very kinds of work, which is self generates greater economic development. I would, I would suggest. So, I, so that's that's the short answer. I actually think there's far more money than we think. It's just much more less evenly distributed than it once was. And I don't mean to redistribute it to individuals. I mean to take it to the common pot in order to use it for important public buildings, public restoration projects, and the like. We used to have many more programs to actually invest in, rest, in preservation and restoration. And even the recent tax bill cut back on the tax incentives for historic restoration. We, it doesn't have to be that way at all. It's a choice. Spoken about some very impressive uh, ideas uh, that have been uh, to provide memorials to tell particular stories out of history, sometimes very, very important stories. Uh, uh, but in, uh, and often requires a huge commitment of uh, resources of, of government nature. Of course, in Portland, uh, our tradition of historic preservation has been much more to tell the uh, more prosaic stories of the past, uh, how people lived in a prosperous New England city in the 19th century. And uh, perhaps you can indeed find uh, plaques, for instance, that show where the locations of the Underground Railway uh, stops were, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but uh, uh, as opposed to uh, having uh, individual self-conscious memorials of this kind, uh, how about trying to uh, configure the cityscape a bit uh, so that it does, in fact, uh, evoke the feeling uh, as it was of the 19th century, particularly when we have so many uh, resources that are currently extant uh, that can remind us that way in terms of neighborhoods and in terms of uh, structures which modest themselves can contribute to the story. I think I can only agree with that. I mean, we certainly, I think, I, I mean, did I, did I miss here? I mean, you're, you're suggesting we should be working hard to preserve rather than simply building memorials to that time, preserve those things that actually lived in the time. Absolutely, these things go hand in hand. I mean, I would, I would suggest that we still have a lot to do in terms of interpreting and telling the stories of the places um, that the, even that have been preserved, right? And, you know, we were talking earlier, we often, and I showed, I, I played into this by talking about slavery, for instance, and going to the South. Well, we're all, we live in New England, we were all beneficiaries of, and even, I mean, even if we are all immigrants long since that time, 
we benefited from the wealth generated from that. Textiles, sugar, rum, everything. And there, there's, important, there's an important story to be told there. That started to be told, but every city needs to do that, to say, what, this house is here, it's a beautiful house, where did that money come from? Let's not, that doesn't mean to condemn those people forever. It means to understand what went alongside um, the, the, the building of the, of, this, of the city. But as I was saying before, the, 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 there's nothing that makes a sense of place than a, a continuum of history in a site. And that's what preservation at, at base does. Preservation organizations all over the country and in Portland um, have built up laws to support preservation um, and usually following the Secretary of the Interior standards. Yeah. So I'm curious if you see movement at, at places like the government and the National Park Service standards and, or the National Trust. What kind of movement are you looking for? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, you would really be, in Portland, we would be changing our preservation ordinance. Right, right. To achieve what you're talking about. So, is that happening? Right. So, it's interesting. No, it's a very good question. Because, because I do think, um, at times, well, this is interesting. The Secretary of Interior Standards, in some ways, I, I think, are, can be far too rigid um, and inhibit adaptive reuse that we want to encourage. On the other hand, there's also enormous amount of flexibility. That's what's been striking to me, is that while I look at the, if you look at the face of the policies and the rules, you could say this has got to be changed. On the other hand, there's been some impressive wiggle room as, on inter issues of integrity and, and the like that has allowed us to preserve and get landmarked places of cultural importance that might not otherwise, by the letter of the law, fit. That said, um, I've been struck, and I'm going to this will come back to haunt me, but I've been struck by the unwillingness of preservation organizations, including our National Trust, which I love dearly, to really be willing to lead a campaign to make some changes that need to happen at that. And I think there's a fear, uh, without getting too political, there's a fear that if we open it up at this particular moment, it will change in ways that we don't like, or that many preservationists don't like. I'll just put it that way. Um, but I think that doesn't, that, that should not preclude us from mapping out what kind of changes we would want. Why do we, have we not developed in detail the kind of proposal, and I, this, I'm looking in the mirror as well, the detailed proposal for a, a works preservation administration? Why don't we lead that debate? There's a lot of just talk about infrastructure, a national infrastructure project. Why don't we think about what that would look like? So, and that's partly answered to you, um, is that I don't think we've done, we have yet um, statewide and national organizations built the common coalition to lead to lead to big changes like that. We're still very much, in many ways, implementing rules made 50 years ago. And we're not quite we're not quite willing enough to challenge them and, and be willing to throw them out and start over in some in some instances. All right. Good. Um, can you talk about the necessity of making the argument um, that preservation? Be environmentally friendly, um, and I believe that completely. Do you have any any good thoughts about how to win that argument, though? Because I feel like it's a little like big pharma and you know, and um, and then other sort of like health strategies where there isn't a lot of money to be made. There's so much, uh, there's so much corporate energy and tech, and tech energy behind the you know, the, the high-tech green right. how do How do we win that argument? Well, so, that's a very good question. I mean, some of the ways we win, I don't know if people heard that, how do we win the argument for making preservation more central to sustain, sustainability when there's a lot of, lot of power uh, in other directions, in, other, in focusing on solar panels and geothermal, et cetera, right? So it's a, very, it's a very good question. One is that we have increasingly good proof, and that's been a preservation, I would say, in the sustainability work aspect of preservation, has done some really good research to show the value of reusing uh, historic buildings. Um, there's also, I mean, there's good writing simply on, like, like you know, um, David Owen, Green Manhattan, just showing that when you live closer together, tends to be in historic places, 
that people who live there are just uh, simply much more environmentally friendly, just by the very, if you live in downtown Portland, you are, you are a hero. Just be, you probably walk more, you probably take public transportation more, you live in a, an older building. That in itself um, will help enormously. So we, part of it is making the, in making the argument through the, through, through the, through the research. I think. Um, and I've just forgotten my second point about that. Will I remember it in five seconds? Um, I'm afraid I lost it. But there's a broader campaign to be led uh, um, around that. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I can't remember. I'll, I'll come back to it. But yeah, but it is, it's a very good question because there's a lot arrayed against it. And that is a, that's a big, that's a big problem. And it means, I think, well, partly what I wanted to say was it means building coalitions. That means preservationists are sitting there with the public transportation folks as allies. Because if you build more public transportation and you make the city more livable that way, that will help preservation as well. I, here's the point I was going to make. Small changes in our laws, as I was alluding to with Holyoke, can lead to big changes. If it, Massachusetts has had a law that's out there about carbon taxation, for instance, right? It hasn't passed yet, but it's there and it's got support and it could pass. If it passed and suddenly corporations would find it much, much more to their tax advantage to work in downtown Holyoke because they would, they would have a lower carbon footprint, suddenly you could see, not instantly, but you could see like the whole, the curve would be, would be bent towards that. So there are policy changes that we could make that would value historic places because of their environmental friendliness that would lead, that would start the dominoes falling. So in that way, it can be, it can be a, a legislative battle that can precede the transformation. If you win that legislative battle, then the economic calculation will be, oh, of course I'm going to move my, my business out of Long Meadow and where I'm getting charged as big tax because I have a big office park and I'm going to move it into a 150-year-old, beautiful, well-built, historic silk factory building. Thank everyone. Thank you.